Welcome to 11 Minutes, a free webcast series exploring the more interesting challenges facing colleges and universities. 11 Minutes is offered by Acrobatic, a Carnegie Mellon University company that partners with educators to improve online learning. I'm Hal Turner, and I'm the Director of Customer Support at Acrobatic. Today, higher ed expert Dr. Keith Hampson offers a primer on learning analytics and will help you to start thinking about how it might improve student performance and retention, uncover student needs, and enable your institution to boost positive results. Please feel free to post your questions as we progress, and we will address them in order. This webcast will conclude with information on contacting Dr. Hampson, a download link for this recording, and ways to join the online discussion about using learning analytics to improve higher education. Thank you for joining us. Several experts and organizations have identified learning analytics as one of the key developments in higher education. But what analytics does and doesn't involve, its purposes, mechanics, and so forth, is often unclear, partly because a common language has not yet emerged, and partly because the possibilities for creating and using learning analytics are so wide open to creative application. Therefore, we thought it would be helpful to provide a quick overview of the subject for those that are relatively new to it, and we'll touch on a few of its key elements. Now, in an 11-minute webcast, we'll obviously leave much out. But at the end of this, we've included some resources that will allow you to dig as deep as you want into the subject. Let's start with a definition. According to the First International Conference on Learning Analytics and Knowledge, the practice involves the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs. In simpler language, it's about capturing the right data, reporting data, analyzing the data, and we would add being prepared to act on the data, turning the information into action, using it to improve the student experience and outcomes. The underlying assumptions of this work are plain to see. First, that more and better information in the hands of the educator, the student, and the institution about a student's learning strengths, preferences, and needs will lead to a more successful educational experience. And second, that technology is going to make this process of capturing and manipulating data scalable, affordable, and ultimately better. So as learning analytics is ultimately about the measurement of learning, it's important to underline just how central this is to the mission of higher education. While higher ed serves many functions, indeed the diversity of its functions is one of its greatest challenges, high quality measurement of learning is fundamental as the institution serves as a gatekeeper. It's an officially sanctioned mechanism for the distribution of publicly recognized credentials. And I strongly suspect thoughtful and sophisticated measurement of learning will become increasingly central to the institution in the near term. As student movement between institutions increases, as the backgrounds of students continue to diversify, as the volume of learning that occurs outside of formal institutions continues to expand, and, of course, as the pressure for greater value continues to unfold. Let's now break learning analytics down to its basic components. Malcolm Brown's work here is particularly useful. He divides the types of information that we're collecting into two very broad categories. First of all, dispositional indicators. This is essentially a learner profile. Information about the learner can be pulled from registration records, the learner's educational history, current GPA, demographic information such as age and sex, and so forth. It can also include information from self-evaluations done by the learner. The hope here is that the information about the learner beyond what they do in a particular course will help us serve and support that student better. The second category is activity and performance indicators. This is what a student does in the process of learning. It's the digital breadcrumbs that students leave behind while interacting with instructional media activities and other learners. This is typically captured within a learning management system but on other platforms as well, such as ebook readers. Indicators captured can include, for example, the number of times a student has logged into the learning management system, the amount of time spent on the course website, the number of discussion posts, 
completed quizzes. It's important to point out, and I'll revisit this again in a few minutes, that this kind of information, the number of discussion posts, for example, does not necessarily provide us with much insight into what the student is learning or not. It may be best characterized as capturing student activity rather than student learning. These indicators are then turned into reports, often in the form of visualizations, that make interpreting data easier and lead to new insights. But like anything else, the value of what comes from this is dependent on what goes into it. The question then becomes, what do we do with the information? Brown divides this into two camps, automated responses and semi-automated. Automated responses, obviously, are generated by the application itself, according to a script. If, for example, a student spends increasingly less time in a course, we can program the application to send an alert to the instructor or student or both. A semi-automated response, on the other hand, provides the instructor or the support staff, typically, with information about the student's activity, but leaves the type of intervention up to them. Within these simple components I've described, there are a vast number of choices to be made about how best to design and deploy learning analytics. There's an opportunity here to design a system that truly aligns with your particular institution's objectives. Much of what I've described thus far has promise and will add value, but these efforts don't always provide us with a true sense of what learning is actually taking place. Much of what is currently understood as learning analytics offers merely proxies for learning, rather than actual evidence of learning. Let me flesh out the difference between these different approaches in very broad strokes. A learning analytics program may seek, for example, to capture how much time a student spends on a page within an online component of a course, with the hope that it gives the instructor some sense of the student's level of engagement. And it could be a sign of engagement, but it may be a sign of something altogether different. We know, for example, that students regularly have more than five browser windows open at a time, so the student may not even be looking at that particular browser window at all within the course. It may signal that the student is totally confused, and it may mean that they are currently looking for more instructional guidance outside of the course site. Learning analytics that limits its focus to capturing student activity is consistent with the expression paving the cow paths. This great expression describes the tendency to use technology not to move beyond old practices, but to use them simply to do old practices more efficiently. I'm reminded of a conference presentation I recently witnessed in which the speaker described with some pride how analytics would allow him to challenge a student's request for a better grade by telling them, after consulting the course analytics, that the student only reviewed the course ebook, let's say, 18 times during the course. Now, this is analytics, certainly, but I'm not sure it's learning analytics. It's not a move forward if our goal is better measurement of learning. We need to make sure that the analytics focuses on evidence of learning, not merely evidence of activity. Did the student understand the material, and if not, why? What competencies has the student mastered? Which students are struggling, and with which concepts, skills, and techniques? Which skills are students struggling with most, the least? What misconceptions are leading to poor performance? Accurate information about what students are learning and what they're not learning, and why. We can then build the kind of instructional activities and support systems that truly make a difference. Carnegie Mellon University and the Open Learning Initiative has spent more than 10 years developing an understanding of how people learn, the right educational technologies, and the instructional methodologies that make it possible for us to understand not just what students are clicking on in their courses, but how well they are actually learning. This research and development work serves as the foundation of our work at Acrobatic. Now let me finish with a few simple recommendations about where you might get started with learning analytics. 
One, before all else, find out what types of data you already have on hand at your institution. Get these systems, SIS, CRM, and LMS, and other ac acronyms, for example, speaking to one another. You'd be surprised what you already have. Two, be sure to protect privacy standards. Anytime we're dealing with data that connects to people, whether students or instructors, we need to be sure that we respect personal and professional interest. On the other hand, greater transparency, all things considered, will improve our ability to serve students. You need to find a way to strike the right balance. Three, you'll find that as your institution digs deeper into learning analytics, that you invariably find yourselves debating what it is that the students should actually be learning. This is to be expected, and it's an excellent byproduct of developing better measurement of learning. Four, make a commitment to actually use the information. It is not that difficult to generate more information in our colleges and universities. It's something that we do pretty well. Putting it to use is more difficult, and it's ultimately where the rubber hits the road. Five, if your institution, like most institutions, draws resources from external providers such as textbook companies, be prepared to ask them some tough questions about how their materials and services support your institution's need to better measure learning. Thanks for joining us for an overview of learning analytics in higher ed. Now the deeper dialogue on practical application can begin. Visit the URL here and in the chat window for information relating to today's talk. The webpage includes links to several resources, such as more on learning analytics, Facebook and Twitter posts pertaining to this webcast, a recording of this webcast or just the slide deck, and Dr. Hampson's direct contact information. This URL will also be sent out via email following the webcast to all attendees. You can learn more about Acrobatic on our website, acrobatic.com, keeping in mind that Acrobatic ends with the letter Q. Find Acrobatic's social media offerings at facebook.com slash acrobatic or twitter.com slash acrobatic. I'm Hal Turner, and I want to thank you for joining us on this journey of improvement for higher education. <laughs>